Semester A, Time Structures Week 4, Rhythm Generation and Symmetry. Last week, we looked at frogs, a series of variation techniques that can be brought into play after a basic rhythm has been chosen. But what about primary rhythmic generation techniques? I've talked about pulse interference. Now I want to go into it in a bit more detail. According to Schillinger, rhythm occurs quite naturally as the result of collision between regular pulses of different frequency. Think of our distant ancestors sitting in their caves 30,000 years ago, listening to the water dripping from the rocks. This kind of collision or pulse interference might have been a very fundamental experience of rhythm. The slide you're looking at shows a simple interference pattern of two pulses traveling at different frequencies. They begin at the same moment and then go in and out of phase, creating a rhythmic cycle. Now the frequency of each pulse is represented by the numbers in a ratio, in this case, three to two. And that means that a pulse, call it A, travels at three time units, while another pulse, B, travels at two time units. Both pulses start at the same moment. In the diagram, each small box represents a unit of time. The down arrows show the onset of the pulse. Pulse A and B come back in synchronization together again, only after six units of time have elapsed. So you're looking at two cycles of interference. On the third row of the diagram, the combined arrows are shown all put into one line, and this gives us the final pattern of the rhythm. It's simple then to count the distance between the down arrows of this third row and simply represent the results as numbers. The number pattern on the fourth row could easily be turned into music notation simply by assigning the number one to your chosen music symbol. The terminology type one refers to the length of the cycle of this rhythm. The original numbers in the ratio three and two, which Schellinger calls generators, give us the length of the rhythmic cycle. In this case, it's the product of the generators in the ratio. That means multiplying the two numbers, three and two, together to make six. Six, then, is the length of the rhythmic cycle. I've already described how number patterns can be turned into music notation by assigning the number one to a particular music notation symbol. In this slide, you can see I've done this in two different ways within one piece of music. The clarinet part is measured against a continuous pulse where one equals a triplet quaver. You can see that above the clarinet stave. While the piano part, a bass line, is measured against a regular pulse stream of quavers so that one equals an ordinary quaver. This is a further example of how music can simultaneously consist of different pulse streams, and also an illustration of how Schillinger explains and incorporates the idea of tuplets into his system. Last week, I showed how tuplets of all kinds can result simply as a decoration, a subdivision of a particular duration. Here we have an example of how tuplets can be built into the fabric of the score by deciding that a particular part will be based on a particular measurement in triplets or quintuplets or some other form of irrational division of the beat. All pulse interference patterns are symmetrical, non-retrogradable rhythms, Messiaen calls them. You can see in this slide how they are economical because the first half generates the second. They're balanced and contrasting. The contrast in this slide can be seen between the first and the second elements of the rhythm, the three and the one. The difference between those numbers, which equals two, three minus one is two, represents the degree of contrast, 
while at the centre of the rhythm, 2-2, two, two, is a perfectly balanced unit of pulse. Finally, these rhythms are cyclical and complete, so there's something pithy and distinctive about these rhythms. There's another kind of interference pattern, which I call type 2, and it's distinguished from type 1 in that the ratio is underlined. You can also see that there's a difference. Although the numbers in the ratio are the same in both cases so far, we've looked at the ratio 3 to 2, but in this case the result is longer than the first. Type 2 rhythms are significant then because the length of the cycle is always a square of the larger number in the ratio. In this case, 3 times itself, or 3 squared, equals 9. And if you add up the result, 2, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 2, you'll see it equals 9. The fact that the length of this cycle is a square will have profound consequences when we examine other rhythmic techniques in later weeks, and you'll be able to see how these patterns can be integrated with a number of other methods and routines. Now, type 2 rhythms are made slightly differently. Because they're longer and the larger number influences that length, then everything else is influenced by the larger number. So the number of phases of the smaller pulse, 2, is determined by the larger pulse. The second row of the diagram shows three pulses separated by two time units each, three lots of two. But this doesn't allow the rhythm to complete as it would in a type one pattern. So we must begin a second group of the smaller pulse, the two pulse, on the second phase of the larger pulse. You can see in the fourth column of the diagram, there's a double asterisk over the second appearance of the longer pulse. And that points down in turn to the third row, where you can see another phase of the two group beginning. And you go on doing this effectively until the rhythm cycles and completes, which it will do eventually. Sometimes when you're working out much bigger ratios, like 7 to 5, for example, you'll have to make quite extensive graphs and tables in order to work this out, because many phases of the smaller generator are required. But don't worry too much about doing all that hard graft. I've done it for you, and you're now looking at a table that you can access in the Resources folder, which gives you the symmetries, the resultant patterns for all the ratios between 2 and 9. The type 1 ratios can be seen in the left-hand side of the page, the first three columns on the left, and the type 2 rhythms are shown in columns 4, 5 and 6. But before we get on to those, let's just go back a step and look in detail at the two different symmetries that we've seen so far. You can see here that 3 to 2 by, as type 1 gives us the result 2, 1, 1, 2. 3 to 2 underline, which is the type 2, gives us a longer pattern. But all of the numbers are the same as the result of type 1. In other words, only 2s and 1s are used. If you compare the two kinds of 4 to 3 rhythm, you'll see that the same is true. There are no new or different numbers, that is, between the two types. Type 2 is simply longer than type 1. If you look again at the table of symmetries, you can see that some of the type 2 rhythms have an awful lot of 1s in the middle. For example, 9 to 2 down on the bottom right hand side of the table is a rhythm that goes 2, 2, 2, 2, 65 ones, 2, 2, 2, 2. 65 ones is an awful lot of ones. So what do we do with all those ones? Well, actually, they're rather useful. And of course, there's no reason why they can't be fused together or silenced or grouped in order to make very exciting patterns. Here's an example of our sort of 1920s ragtime piano part, which uses the type 2 rhythm 8 to 3. And you can see there are quite a lot of ones there in the middle, which I've grouped into small melodic cells and 
used to make quite a convincing phrase. Or here's another example. Type 2 rhythm 7 to 2, which also has a large quantity of ones. Here, they've been used to fashion a hi-hat part. You'll find symmetrical rhythmic patterns cropping up in all kinds of music throughout the centuries. Here are just two little examples taken from Schumann's piano cycle Carnival. Now I'm not suggesting that Schumann deliberately or consciously thought about symmetrical rhythm when he was writing these phrases, far from it. But I am suggesting that they, because they're naturally occurring phenomena, they're likely to crop up in human music all over the world. again at the Anlo Ewe example in Time Structure's Week 3 folder. Now, of course, there's nothing to stop you making your own symmetrical patterns. They may not correspond to a particularly easy-to-handle musical cycle, but there's no reason why they won't be effective. I'd like you to create some examples and put them in the group discussion area, please. <laughs> 